We saw it with our own eyes. On January 6th, thousands of American citizens stormed the Capitol building in an effort to stop the certification of Joe Biden's presidential victory. The mob had just attended a rally headlined by Donald Trump. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not gonna have a country anymore. They wore Trump-branded clothing and waved Trump flags. Over 150 of the rioters have already pled guilty, all supporters of the former president and members of right-wing organizations like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. And yet within 24 hours of the incident, many were already trying to put the blame elsewhere. We also knew that there's always bad actors that will infiltrate large crowds. Now, there were likely not all Trump supporters, and there are some reports that Antifa sympathizers may have been sprinkled throughout the crowd. Over the last year, conspiracy theories have circulated claiming that the riot was a false flag, a staged event enacted by performers known as crisis actors, and that the real perpetrators were not Trump supporters at all, but leftist groups like Antifa or even government agencies like the FBI. They were almost certainly working for the FBI. You would think that the massive volume of visual evidence would make it impossible to question the official version of what happened on January 6th. And yet by the following month, 58% of surveyed Trump supporters said they viewed the event as mostly an Antifa-inspired attack. How can a conspiracy theory as flawed as the crisis actor be so successful? To try and answer that question, I spoke to conspiracy theory researcher and associate professor at the University of Washington, Kate Starbird. I covered the Sandy Hook tragedy, and years later, I met someone who thought the whole thing was fake, was a setup. It was filled with crisis actors. But first, I was stunned, and then I had to offer him sort of some first-person evidence saying, I sat in these people's homes. They didn't fake their children's murders, right? And it just made me wonder, like, how bad is it? How do we get to this point? You know, one of, one of the things we see in conspiracy theorizing is that um, there are a set of tropes or sort of pieces of stories that can be picked up and reassembled to, to create a new conspiracy theory for different events or different things in the world. And crisis actors is a common trope that can be used in a lot of different ways to try to deny um, what, what's happening to try to deny sort of one reality. It, it becomes really easy for someone to absorb the new theory because they've heard something like that before. And so you've already got like a, a soft audience who's ready to believe that, that theory. Terms like false flag and crisis actor are relatively new, but the accusation goes back a long time. In 1957, nine black children who were trying to integrate a white school in Little Rock, Arkansas, were accused by segregationists of being paid actors. Before that, there were attempts to discredit the congressional testimony of African Americans about the cruelties of slavery by claiming they were paid to tell false stories. And dictators from Slobodan Milosevic to Bashar al-Assad have tried to minimize protests by blaming them on paid or foreign agitators. Today, the crisis actor accusation is used to question a variety of events, from mass shootings to police brutality to vaccine efficacy. The evidence provided is typically flimsy, deeply illogical, and even downright deceptive. And yet, despite repeated debunkings, the theories continue to get traction, especially on the internet. So what gets to me is, is why do these things stick if it's so easy to be disproven? And so the internet allows us to do a couple of really interesting things. One is there's far more evidence to select from, all these different videos, all these different snapshots and, and different websites that you can go to to find little pieces of evidence. And then on top of that, the internet allows us to sort of crowdsource to find the best conspiracy theory. One of the things we used to tell people when they're, when they're trying to figure out the credibility of something is we say, well, triangulate, right? I saw it over here in this kind of site, and I saw it over in this other one, a very different kind of site. And that when you find something in multiple different places, it gives you this idea that you've triangulated and that and that, that content may be more true. Unfortunately, on the internet, co content gets copied and pasted across different websites. So we may get the perception that we're seeing 
different content from different sources in different places, but it's a false sense of, of triangulation because it's actually the same content that's being just repasted across different kinds of websites and domains. The events that become targets for this type of conspiracy theory seem disparate, but they do have some things in common. They tend to be highly emotional stories supported by photographic or video evidence that evokes strong feelings of sympathy or outrage. And they exist along the fault lines of political polarization. The official story of Sandy Hook has more holes in it than Swiss cheese. So is there, is there a motivation? I mean, are these conspiracy theories used to recruit people towards a certain point of view about the world or just to cast more aspersions on members of the press? I think we have to separate the, the people that often even produce conspiracy theories and are involved in like, you know, trying to interpret that way, the world through that lens, separate them from the people who strategically amplify conspiracy theories because it it helps them achieve their political goals. At some point, I always wonder, you must get something back from believing in whatever you believe in. So what's the psychological benefit to believing in conspiracy theory? We like to see patterns. We like to have explanations that have sort of villains and, and causes, especially when there's something random. Like if we think about, you know, someone going into a school and shooting children, there's other factors in there, but essentially it's this random act that, that is horrific and hard for us to make sense of. The internet and social media in particular is a perfect breeding ground for crisis actor conspiracy theories. It offers an almost limitless set of data points from which to cherry pick evidence, a crowdsource structure that organically selects the most viral theories from thousands of permutations, and a pattern of copying and pasting that provides the illusion of multiple sources. And recent revelations from the January 6th Commission revealed that several TV personalities who on air implied that Antifa were responsible for the riot were privately blaming someone else. The president needs to tell people in the Capitol to go home. This is hurting all of us. He is destroying his legacy, Laura Ingram wrote. Is the harm that conspiracy theories are causing in society, is it reparable? I do think we're at a moment where once that way of thinking that we don't trust the information that we're seeing spreads across enough of society, especially in a democratic society, we're losing the shared ground that we need to stand upon to govern ourselves as a democracy. If we don't have a shared reality, we can't really come together to make some of the decisions we need to make to, to combat things like climate change or a pandemic uh, and some of these other things. Uh, can we turn it around? I'm ho I hope so. I, I'm not always, not every day am I optimistic about that, but I certainly have a lot of hope and there are a lot of folks who care about this problem who are trying to address it from different perspectives. As cameras become more pervasive, we amass more visual evidence of important events. For those looking to discredit them, this requires more convoluted conspiracy theories that undermine the very idea of knowable truth. The crisis actor accusation is particularly destructive to our shared sense of reality because it asks us to not even believe what we see with our own eyes. While there can be some psychological comfort in dismissing horrible tragedies as staged, it's at the expense of the victims who are demonized and persecuted during their trauma and our ability as a society to confront problems and try to make our world a better place. Until next time, don't spread fake news, keep it real. I'm Hari Srinivasan and this is Take On Fake. Thanks for watching.